um, we should mark that because we certainly wouldn't all be sitting around the table here uh, working so much more collaboratively um, together for patients across the country without your contribution over the last 18 months, um, which has been really <coughs> significant. Um, we also wouldn't have um, such a high-performing NHS without your contribution, not just in the last 18 months, but over the last three decades, um, from starting out in learning disability all the way through to the centre of the NHS here. So uh, on behalf of everyone, I'd just like to thank you for your, your passion, your professionalism, right down to the last second in the job, uh, and your deep commitment, which I know is very, very genuine to patients and citizens across the country. So thank you. Well, thank you for that. You embarrassed me, Dido. Um, uh, so I shall try and get over my embarrassment and speak very briefly. I mean, first, um, uh, every job I've held in the NHS since I started the front line of care with people with learning disabilities um, has been a privilege. Um, and this job over the last 18 months has been no different. Um, it uh, is a great pleasure to me to see NHS England and NHS Improvement come together. It's entirely the right thing. We've had an interesting ride, I think, all of us as senior employees um, and members of the team over the last 18 months. Um, and we obviously enter a new phase now. Uh, at a personal level, uh, it's a, been a huge privilege. Um, I think uh, the organization is now set for real opportunity with the long-term plan, and we'll talk about that, I'm sure, in a minute. And so all I can say is to thank the board for their kind words um, and uh, to wish the new management team, Simon and Amanda, and the rest of you, um, all the best in the important and vital work that you continue to do on behalf of our patients. So thank you very much. We look forward to watching all three of you do fantastic things uh, in the next chapters of your lives. So thank you. With that, first item on the agenda now, David is uh, Chair's report. Do you want to? Well, I just want very, very brief. Um, and maybe illustrate it just with three things, really. Firstly, in visits to uh, leave the northeast and actually Valencia in Spain. I've seen that how joined out care really makes a huge difference. If we can bring together primary care, community care, uh, and secondary care, then we can deliver a much better service to our to our patients. Secondly, um, I've, I'm on the board of Genomics England, and um, I've been up to both Manchester and Newcastle in the last sort of month and seen how genomic medicine is now beginning to become mainstream. As, a, as an offering to our patients, if you like. And actually seeing someone who's alive today because some of this, these new CAR T and gene therapies mm. just brings it home, actually, that this is, this is a really important sort of new branch of medicine. <coughs> and then thirdly, I had a um, sort of um, around the table discussion group with about 20 people from BME backgrounds in the London Ambulance Service um, earlier, earlier this week. And hearing the story of people who've worked for the NHS, in, in some cases for 30 years, who felt that they'd been invisible throughout that time, just brought it home to me how much more work that we need to do to really um, recognize and motivate um, people from the BME, people from BME backgrounds, and how much of a contribution, how much of a, more of a contribution that they can make. So they're just a three sort of little snapshot. Well, I can take straight from your third and maybe just add a few fr uh, other thoughts from my last few months. So yesterday I was at a UK India Week conference, healthcare forum, where actually, David, the words you've just used, a um, BME consultant um, used exactly the same, that she felt that she had been invisible. Uh, so we've both been hearing the same feedback and I know we both care deeply about it. I've spent a lot of time in the last six months um, leading the work to develop the Interim People Plan, which was published uh, a few weeks ago. Um, special thanks to David Bean in his uh, companionship and um, cooperation as we've developed that together and to Julian Hartley who presented at the last joint board meeting. Um, that work is really only just beginning as we've set out the interim people plan with a commitment to produce a full people plan uh, within a couple of months of the spending review and uh, really by the end of the year uh, regardless. Uh, and making the NHS the best place to work in across the country is the overriding theme of that. And there's no doubt we will only do that if we make it an inclusive place for everyone who wants to work in health and social care. 
So a large amount of my time has been devoted to that. And then as I've been getting out and about, I'm increasingly trying to spend more time shadowing people. And so I had a fascinating day shadowing the physician's response units that work out of the Royal London. And this is a, a car that is uh, staffed by a doctor and a paramedic. And they're working in collaboration with the Royal London, the uh, London Ambulance Service and the Air Ambulance Service. And it was completely extraordinary to see what they are able to do in patients' homes. And, and it's so in keeping and in tune with the direction of travel of the long-term plan, pushing care out to people's homes. And uh, it was a brilliant uh, lesson in innovative new models of care that are being tested and developed across the country. So mm. that's just a snapshot from me of one of the things I've been doing. Okay. Any questions or comments on David's and mine report? Brilliant. Good. So um, Chief Exec's report. Um, Ian? Simon, who, which of you would like to go first? Do you want to go first, um, Yeah, just two uh, very quick things from me, really. Um, first, um, pleased to be able to publish um, the uh, end-of-year report for the NHS provider sector um, in the last couple of weeks, um, looking at the achievements, um, the considerable achievements, I think, of uh, the 1.1 million staff who work in our 226 provider organisations. Too much in that to highlight in general. Uh, just a couple of very quick uh, points, I think. Uh, first, uh, I think despite recording once again record demand for hospital, community and mental health services, which absolutely were recorded, I think particularly gratifying to see um, more patients being treated within national standards than ever before. The first winter on winter improvement um, in core performance in five years. The number of 52-week waiters reduced by over 63% and a significant uh, improvement um, in the financial performance uh, of the provider sector. Uh, so I think it is not the case, of course, that there is not more to do, and the long-term plan will be critical in that. But I think it is worth just thanking Absolutely. the 1.1 million staff and their leadership um, for what I think, under extraordinary circumstances in terms of demand, um, was actually a very strong performance last year and one that in many respects was stronger than the previous few years. So I think that is a massive testament to the quality <coughs> of leadership and frontline delivery uh, across our provider sector. And so I was happy to present that um, uh, to the public um, and to uh, our staff. And, and then just for the record, um, a massive congratulation to uh, Kettering General Hospital. Um, it's uh, always really gratifying when uh, a trust uh, that's uh, in special measures and has therefore got particular challenges um, exits and they were successful um, in exiting quality special measures in May. Um, and I think that's an important testament to the fact that you know, real work's been done there to ensure that the services patients get are improved. Uh, and at the end of the day, that is what it is about. So I think it's just worth uh, always mentioning uh, that at this point as well. I think that's probably enough for me, Dido. Happy to hand over to Simon at this point. Fantastic. Thank you. Well, uh, thank, thank you, Ian. And uh, let me just add my thanks to Ian for his uh, leadership and partnership uh, in his uh, stewardship of uh, NHS improvement and before that. I think it's been a very productive period of the coming together of the two organisations, and I greatly enjoyed the opportunity to work with, uh, with Ian. Uh, the same is true for my partnership uh, with Matthew, uh, who, as you said, uh, David, has been leading uh, NHS England for three years now. And for all of the big changes that have been underway for the last three years, has been an instrumental part of that, whether it's driving the improvements on uh, the information and technology agenda, the oversight of uh, operational performance, and really being uh, the sort of spiritual driver of a lot of the move towards integrated care and population health, which is now sort of hardwired into what we're trying to do with the long-term plan. So. I'm um, immensely grateful to Matthew as well for his personal leadership and uh, everything that he's done for the NHS and for NHS England over that period. Obviously, those thoughts remind us that the whole of the two organisations are in the process of uh, very considerable change, and we are right in the middle of that as we speak. Uh, yes, we've gone through the first two phases of the uh, organisational redesign, but actually the bulk of our staff are now about to be affected by the uh, change process. Uh, we will be going through a uh, public staff consultation in July and August, uh, with a lot of people affected September, October and November. 
Um, as part of that, uh, I've been spending uh, a lot of time over the last six weeks uh, out with our staff from NHS Improvement and NHS England in local offices across the country, 13 different uh, visits over that period of time, uh, hearing direct from our people in places like Derby and Liverpool, uh, Southampton, Leeds, London, Rotherham, Manchester, Lincoln, Doncaster, uh, Brighton uh, to come along with Taunton and the East Midlands. And I think uh, we just have to acknowledge uh, as, a, as two boards uh, that that is kind of the state of play across the organization uh, as a whole. Uh, Emily may want to uh, if you, uh, come in uh, in a moment. Uh, but at the same time as we are grappling with some real operational pressures which are on the agenda today and it's vitally important that the health service keeps that focus and we're kicking off the process for the long-term plan implementation, I think as two boards, let's just remember what our own staff are going through uh, through this period. Absolutely. If I can maybe just mention three other things briefly that aren't otherwise covered on the agenda. Uh, the first is that, picking up your point, Dido, on the uh, work with uh, our staff people across the NHS as a whole, just to record that the uh, Junior Doctors Committee of the BMA uh, have now voted in favour of a new junior doctors uh, pay settlement which ends the uh, period of uh, disagreement between uh, themselves and government. What that means is that we go into the next several years with not only the junior doctors on a multi-year uh, settlement but of course the bulk of our staff through Agenda for Change and as we know the GPs uh, through the five-year contract. So that provides additional certainty for the whole of the health service uh, as we go into the LTP implementation process, which I think is uh, our boards would welcome. Uh, secondly, we have seen on Monday of this week the response of the Health Select Committee to the legislative proposals which the boards have previously discussed, and we very much welcome the strong support that they have given for the uh, thrust of the proposals uh, that we've set out. That's obviously a discussion we'll be taking forward with the new administration uh, from the uh, end of July. Uh, and thirdly, uh, just to uh, make the obvious point that we are uh, back into a period of some uncertainty as to uh, Brexit. And so I took the opportunity at the uh, Health Select Committee earlier in the week to make the point that uh, whereas the NHS had uh, very effectively uh, mobilised for the possibility of a March 29th or indeed April 12th uh, Brexit, uh, those uh, plans were put on hold by government uh, on April 26th. And if we are collectively going to uh, be ready uh, again for October 31st, then it's very important that the transport infrastructure that we are completely dependent on, uh, that is put in place. And in fact, uh, since uh, saying that, uh, earlier in the week, uh, I'm pleased that uh, the Cabinet Office have now uh, initiated the beginning of that uh, procurement process uh, that we will uh, clearly rely on. Thanks. Um, any questions or comments? I should say, and forgive me, Michael, for not introducing you at the beginning, I should actually just, we haven't just acquired a, a new <coughs> non-executive director, but we're joined as an observer by Michael Meyer, who is one of the non-executive directors at the Department of Health and Social Care, who is marking our homework today. So. Well, on that basis, I'd better ask a question. I'll <laughs> try <laughs> and make it an intelligent one. Might be a bit of a struggle. To Michael. <laughs> it's an intelligent reply, after all. Um, just on Brexit, Simon. Yes. I mean, we're now in end of June. Um, we could come out with a hard Brexit end of October. I mean, time-wise? I mean, in terms of revamping the plans again, are, you, are we... You comfortable that we're going to, that's going to happen in time? Well, the infrastructure that Keith Woollett and uh, the uh, team that was put in place for March 29th, that infrastructure is still there, but will need to be reactivated. And uh, as Keith uh, and I were discussing earlier in the week, by the time we had got to the run up to March 29th, all uh, 400 or so NHS organisations which were uh, being uh, scrutinised were either green or amber with a plan to get to green uh, for March 29th. We, need, we will need uh, to uh, go out and uh, restart uh, that uh, assurance process. There are some particular issues that government will need to resolve around uh, stockpiling and what the request is of our supply chains, both the health specific and the uh, general. And again, as I said earlier in the week, we've got different 
warehousing uh, and uh, supply requirements uh, over the winter season uh, than we would have had going into uh, the Easter period. But look, the position of the health service uh, always has been. Uh, it is not our job to uh, uh, do anything other than uh, prepare to the greatest uh, extent that we possibly can so that people continue to get the support they need. In doing that, being explicit that there are some dependencies we have on others uh, and helping make sure people uh, clock that fact and take the necessary So having done a review of previous phases, we've put more support in place um, for colleagues in several ways. One is to make sure um, there's an easier way to access expert HR support so people can ask questions in confidence um, about what affects them. Um, we've also invested a bit in helping the two organisations that have come together understand each other. So there's quite a lot of places where um, the organisations didn't really fully understand the expert functions that are being carried out. So, for example, we've put in place a series of WebExes that people can dial into and that are then recorded so people can download them in their own time to understand some of the complex functions the organisations take place. And we've tried to make sure we're both increasing the broadcast information so people get regular updates, but also um, that people can provide feedback and ask questions. So we have a series of frequently asked questions which are being... Um, updated on a rolling basis um, and wherever possible we're doing things as one organisation so for example on the staff survey rather than deciding either uh, improvement or the NHS England staff surveys were correct we've got a working group of colleagues putting together um, a robust new staff survey which is based on obviously data about what makes a good staff survey but also learnings from both organisations that will then be rolled out as our new joint staff survey in the autumn. So making sure as we go, we're trying to make the organisation better to um, support colleagues as they go through what's obviously a really difficult period as well. Great. Thank you. <coughs> David. So I think, I'd, if, Simon, if I could just connect those three or four things. Mm -hmm. You've got management change. Yep. You've got a big external event that will be quite consuming. Um, you've got very significant change within the organisation. And you've also got the long-term plan and the small matter of delivery of performance. Yep. I'm interested in, in knowing how you're thinking of balancing and prioritising those competing claims on the leadership team and on the organisation as a whole. Yeah. Well, obviously, m most of those are not circumstances of our choosing, uh, but therefore, as you say, we've got to decide how we respond to those multiple demands on uh, the organisation's work. We are, when we get onto the discussion on the long-term uh, plan implementation, we are um, heavily uh, relying and expecting that the, the uh, work on that will principally be led uh, locally across the health service by uh, trust CCGs and, uh, and STPs. Uh, on the uh, question of um, the engagement model between us as a new organisation or combined organisation and those local systems, that is one of the things that we are signalling we want to work with frontline leaders on because it's got to be something different than what has preceded, keeping the best of what's gone before but getting rid of things that need to change. So that's, uh, for our regional teams, that's kind of they're going to be their live reality having to make those juxtapositions. But the truth is we can't all do that as NHS England and NHS Improvement. This is something that has to be a shared responsibility with leaders across the health service. And that's part of the reason why Ian and I and colleagues have been spending so much time, I personally have been spending so much time directly with trust chief executives and with CCG leaders over the last uh, six weeks, uh, engaging and hearing from them on how best we do what you've asked. And are there pinch points in the regions? Uh, there are certainly some pinch points in the regions, but I mean, if you, without sort of prefiguring the discussion we're going to have on the LTP, we've agreed with 
our chief execs across the service that there are some big items, whether it's the first trust financial regime, uh, the new capital regime, the redesign of outpatients and so on, that we're going to work direct with our leaders across the health service on, not, not uh, sort of simply leaving that to the regions to try and figure out. But you're right, I mean, you're, you're fundamentally right to point to the multiple uh, stresses bearing down on the organisation at a time of enormous transition. Yeah. Probably sets the scene very nicely for the next couple of yep. agenda items, I think. If everyone's happy, we'll move on. Uh, Julian, are you going to... So I think we're going to kick off with Pauline and Matthew, and then I'll come to the final. Okay. Got Sorry it. about that. It's all right. You're keeping me on my toes. <laughs> Pauline, are you starting? Yes, okay. Um, so I think um, during our last meeting, I indicated that performance from an emergency care point of view during this winter had been better than the previous winter. And this report starts off by confirming that situation, um, not just for the winter, but then looking at the total number of additional patients that we have been able to see or that we were able to see during four hours for the whole of last year, um, which I think was about 800,000. Uh, during the winter period, it was 380,000. So I think a significant increase in the number of patients seen within four hours and for winter proper, uh, higher for our performance um, in spite of or despite the increase in demand um, that Ian referred to earlier. Um, I think importantly for last year and indeed for winter, we saw that real improvement in some of the metrics that mean an awful lot to patients. Um, around 12-hour trolley waits, around waits um, in the back of ambulances to uh, when they arrive at hospital, etc., etc. So I think, again, as we said at the last meeting, that was very much down to the hard work of our staff um, day in, day out. And we've seen that work continue as we have faced some new operational issues um, coming into this um, year. Um, the second thing that we covered um, at our last meeting was looking at demand and what was behind the demand numbers. And we um, explained that we were doing a, a deep dive exercise to understand, um, especially around attendances, the 7.8% increase and what had caused that over the February to April period. Again, it's set out in the paper, so I'm not going to go through it in detail but you will see that it's a combination of starting with a lower base from the previous year because it, this 7.8 is essentially made up of minors and patients with minor um, conditions tended not to arrive in emergency departments um, in the same numbers in our previous winter because of the cold period and because of other um, perceptions that they may have had about how quickly they would have been cared for. But I think really importantly to say that as part of those demand numbers, the very positive reform agenda that we've put in place um, has contributed to where the um, numbers are being counted, in particular around the urgent treatment centres and the scaling up of GP streaming, etc. Um, with regards to admissions, um, we have previously explained the fact that same-day emergency care um, has grown significantly in the last year and indeed we're encouraging its ongoing um, development um, and that does account for a significant impact on what we've seen in the um, admission growth last year um, and again that's set out in the paper. Um, before we sort of leave last year, I think just one final comment to make on it and um, on winter. Um, we talked a lot over the winter period about the contribution of local authorities and that we were getting very positive feedback from our local services, from our local systems um, around the joint working that had taken place and from the data that has now been made available to us, we can see the hard numbers behind that and the real impact that it's had on supporting us um, in managing through the winter and for winter being a very different experience. We've got details about the care packages that were purchased and um, the care at home, etc., etc. Um, the paper then moves on to talk about the ongoing work on transformation, which is clearly very important to us at the moment. 
Um, but basically, we set out here that the progress achieved last year as far as length of stay was concerned continues into this year the same for DTOC. And we give a little bit more information about the ongoing work of the ambulance service on 111, um, where the transformation work continues to be successful. And um, finally, we mention um, 111 online where we now have a 100% rollout, but really importantly, um, a greater coverage of the phase three part of that, which is the total service, to about 81.8% of the population at the moment. If it's okay, I'll just move to um, RTT um, straight away. Um, so again, um, looking at our RTT performance for last year and just highlighting a couple of issues there. I think the first one to highlight is the additional or uh, the total number of patients who have been seen um, during the 18 week period last year and we've seen an addition of 14.3 million which I think is one of the <coughs> highest increases um, over the, the, the previous years and um, again down to a concerted effort from all of our staff and um, Ian mentioned um, in his report the excellent work that was done to support patients not to have long waits and um, the, the 52 week wait issue and uh, the up-to-date information suggests that although the mandate last year was to reduce that by 50 percent by now we have reduced it by 70.2 percent over the peak um, that was last June and again we've highlighted a couple of the transformation um, initiatives that are playing a fundamental part in all of that work. That's it for me. Fantastic. Matthew, do you want to build on that before we open it up? Um, I'll touch on some of the other areas of performance, yeah. if that's okay, John. Um, so I think uh, it's probably first um, just worth, worth making the point that, uh, following on from, from, from Paul in such, that the a and &E departments are working under a, a lot of pressure, them, but we have a range of other routes to get the support you need, which don't involve going to an a and &E department. I was just that if you were living around here in the Elephant and Castle, your options include ringing uh, 111, where 90% uh, mm. of people would get an answer within 60 seconds to, to talk to somebody, and half those people would end up speaking to a clinician. Or they could go to the walk-in centre at Guy's Hospital, where 99% uh, would be seen within four hours, um, would get the appropriate care they needed a whole lot quicker, and leave the St Thomas's A&E department or the King's A&E department for the people who actually need the expert support that, that a major acute hospital has. So mm. do yourself a favour and do the NHS a favour by, by, by using the, same, the, the services uh, properly. And I, and I think those other services are increasingly becoming uh, effective and, and, and important. Um, Touching on just a, just, just a couple of other areas that I think we're talking about. Um, in cancer, people will see that the cancer performance, particularly around 62 days, is not where, where, we, uh, where we want it to be. We saw last year um, a 16% increase in referrals into our, into our cancer services. Um, that is good news. We are identifying more cancers uh, than, we, than we ever have before, which means we're able to treat people more quickly than we ever have before. We saw... Um, an 11% increase in the number of patients being seen and treated within 62 mm. days. So, so that, that is a tremendous performance uh, by, by the NHS. However, the challenge that we've set to the NHS this year is, OK, we now know that in our messaging about come forward if you think you have a cancer problem, come, come forward, make sure that you access the services uh, swiftly. That message is getting through and people are coming forward. Now it is up to the NHS to put the extra capacity in place to make sure that all of those people are, are, are receiving the care as, as quickly as, as is deemed clinically appropriate. And there's a lot of work now going on across the NHS um, to say we now need to put on the extra outpatient clinics, the extra diagnostic services and the extra surgical services in order to ensure that everybody gets treated quickly. And that's, um, so I think, that's, uh, I think that's a major piece of work that we need in order to get ourselves not only uh, seeing and treating more cancer more quickly, but actually hitting the target that we set ourselves, so it's, um, which we're not at the moment. Um, in terms of uh, a new policy and uh, the rollout of primary care networks, uh, is almost covered. We have almost 100% coverage. We're 98% coverage of uh, GP practices now aligned to a primary care network. I think that's 
uh, a tremendous step forward in terms of creating uh, the platform for joined up integrated care for local people um, and, and that work uh, 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 that work goes on um, and in the same vein we've uh, announced um, in the last few days the next three integrated care systems in uh, Buckinghamshire, Oxfordshire and Berkshire West. Uh, Buckinghamshire and Berkshire West were already integrated care systems, Oxfordshire has joined them to make one population uh, group for uh, working together great integrated care. Um, uh, North East and North Cumbria is, is a journey of, of real success. That, that's gone from uh, maybe five years ago being uh, uh, one of our most challenged, most struggling health systems uh, in a special measures regime and, uh, and, and close intervention to now being one of our <coughs> best performing and most closely tightly knit health systems in, 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 in the country and all, all tributes to them. Uh, and lastly, South East London is the first of our London uh, STPs to, to, to move it into being an integrated care system. So, so, so I, I think there's real progress uh, there. Um, we're continuing to uh, hit and be on track for all our mental health targets. So just the last thing I would like to touch on is learning disability and autism. As I, as I hand this role over to Amanda Pritchard, she comes, comes in to take it on. I, I, I hope the board and Amanda will give as much focus to learning disability and autism as we've tried to over, over the last several years. The, the number of people with learning disability uh, in an inpatient setting has fallen um, by 22% um, uh, over the last few years, but our target is to halve that number. There's a lot of work to be done. And uh, perhaps just as importantly, <laughs> the work that we've started to look at the whole of the pathway from does every GP know the patients who have a learning disability or autism who are on their list through to this, before we make a decision to, uh, to admit anyone to hospital or all the pa or is all the support in place to avoid to avoid that right through to um, are, are we focused on getting the right packages of care and the right support in the community to get people back out of hospital and, and living an independent life again and when something goes wrong do we investigate and learn from that there is an entire pathway that, that, that we are working so hard to put in place and I think and I, I'd ask the board just to support that we should continue the focus on that that was laid out in the five-year forward view and repeated in the long-term plan and I think really is a step forward for some of our uh, most vulnerable people in, in, in what the NHS is delivering. Absolutely Mike, absolutely. Julian do you want to come next and then we'll open up? Yeah I mean so just on the finances the paper sets out the position really at the close of 2018-19 and it's already referred to the provider sector uh, position which had a total um, sector adjusted uh, deficit of about 571 uh, million pounds. Um, that is offset for the whole of the NHS on the commissioner side um, with an underspend relative to a uh, plan of 916 million pounds. When that's sort of aggregated at the Department of Health level, there are some ins and outs. Uh, the biggest out is uh, fundamentally the transaction on Carillion, um, mm. which scores as a credit mm. in the sector ad ad adjusted side. So to the Department of Health, the NHS position basically comes in on an £89 million uh, underspend, uh, which is quite a feat on £113 billion mm. uh, of, of spend. And I will certainly congratulate the teams who uh, succeed on achieving that uh, res result. Uh, worth saying on the capital side that um, in aggregate, uh, providers basically underspent against their plans uh, to the tune of about £300 uh, million. Pounds. That is different to then how the Department of Health again looks at it, who sort of set an allocation for the NHS. And relative to that allocation, uh, the overspend is about £350 uh, million. Pounds. Uh, I've just drawn that just for one minute, because although providers underspent against plans, the underspend in 1819 relative to previous years was much lower. Actually, the slippage uh, from what they said they were going to spend to what they spend is much lower. And it probably indicates both um, actually people are getting better at doing what they said they, they were going to do, and indeed some of the pent up demand that is in the system uh, to address maintenance um, issues, which we, of course, will need to be thinking about as we look forward uh, to the future. 
Yeah, I, it was actually just um, following up from um, Pauline and Matthew. So there's a comment and a question. Mm -hmm. So the comment was, um, um, looking at Tim here, in our um, quality committee yesterday, I think we spent the bulk of our time looking at that learning disability work, you know, all the way through to mortality review and the pathway that you described, and a, an amazing video describing the experience mm. of a um, person with learning uh, disabilities in hospital. And um, so I, I just wanted to echo Matthew's point. I think the, the work's been extraordinary, the challenges are huge, and I'm sure we will continue to, to focus on them. So that was a comment. Um, re really, really worthwhile work. Um, and the question was about, um, it was, it's really good to see 111 online um, available everywhere. I wondered whether we were able yet to have a feel for the impact that um, ubiquitous access to 111 online and um, the upping of clinical support on the 111 phone service, actually what impact that was having in reducing unnecessary attendances to face-to-face -to -face care. Do we, do we know? What's yes, so we, we have... Um, we, we have uh, a, a system which allows us to track where, what advice we give to people at 111 and what they actually do to the extent that if we suggest that they go to a pharmacy and they turn up in the A&E department, we can see it. So we can see that as we increase the clinical input, uh, the people taking the advice from 111 had, has improved. There's still a way to go, there's still, um, and there's still an extent to which uh, a and E's are very trusted, and people just end up going there. But but there's no question they are keep they are diverting people away from, from A and E's. And we kind of got, uh, got the acid test of that was last winter, where in places where the A and E where one 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 was under pressure, the A and E's had started to complain that one 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 wasn't wasn't relieving pressure on them. So which is so, so that's mm -hmm. so so I think we uh, Pauline, what do you want to add to that? Uh, no, no, I, I completely agree, and we do monitor very carefully. Um, the rollout of 111 and we will be doing likewise with 111 online and um, to check for the, for the conversion rate and as, as I said to see if people do what we advise them to do. Thank you really uh, for Matthew and Pauline notwithstanding some difficult circumstances and increased demand in a number of areas you touched on A&E and cancer um, what's your sense of confidence about improvement and when and how that will happen in those two areas? Um, I, I, I think to start off by saying that um, this winter has been a very good experience for staff mm -hmm. in the NHS. They have seen the power of transformation and they've seen that it gives patients a much better experience at the end of the day. The services out of hospital, how they've linked in um, to the front of the hospital, etc., etc. Um, and I think that commitment from the total system to understanding that the hospital can't operate in isolation, um, but that it's not just about the transformation agenda, it's about learning new ways of uh, delivering services and new approaches to improvement. Um, and I th so I, I, I think there's an air of confidence at this point. Um, clearly we've got some operational challenges at the moment and we'll need to be able to see if we can go um, further faster um, to keep that confidence and to keep that goodwill. I mean, on, on cancer, I think there are, uh, there are ways we can improve very quickly and some things which are going to take a bit longer. Um, so when we look, firstly we see variation between different different providers confronted by, by the same challenges and we see in most places that a patient referred directly to a cancer center is being seen very quickly it's it's the longer uh, it's the longer cancer alliance it, it's where you go into one DJ and they're referring you to another hospital that, that there is a slowdown and therefore those are things which managerially we can fix because we have the right people the patients are receiving care it's just uh, takes too long uh, takes too long and we have put more money into the system in order to invest in extra capacity. So I've no doubt that we can get quite significant improvement quite quickly. There's, there, is, there is also, though, a, a genuine capacity problem about the right number of the right skilled uh, people, be they endoscopists or be they uh, cancer nurses, or, 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 uh, to run some of those services. And we need to make sure that our 
um, uh, recruitment and training of staff and the changes in working practices so that we use people at what the Americans call it, the limit of their license, but actually getting the, the best skills out of, of all of our people uh, is going to be necessary as well. So, so some of those things we need to be picking up as part of the longer term plan. Other things we need to just get on and do really well now. Ruth, would, and maybe Steve, give us a comment on how clinicians are feeling and you know, would reflect on performance. I think it's all relative, to be honest, compared to this last winter, compared to the winter before. We know with 39,500 registered nursing vacancies across England in the provider sector that things are tough. Things are really tough out there. Although we're doing what we can, I know trusts across the country are making huge strides in their retention collaboratives and retaining more and more staff, being much more flexible. And we're equally rolling out our retention program, particularly focusing on those A&Es that with the most challenged A&Es. We're putting more resource into that. But t it is tough out there for nurses, I'm sure, and um, Steve wants to comment from a wider clinical point of view. And that's why I'm delighted that as part of the interim people plan, we are prioritizing the nursing workforce as the area that we're going to focus on because we do need to address the missing nurses, midwives and care workers if we are going to be able to provide safe care consistently um, along that pathway. And I know with the colleagues in HE um, and indeed uh, every director of nursing in England, we will want to make sure that the nurses' uh, life day in, day out is an improved one as a result of the interim people plan. Yes, yeah, so I'd maybe reflect a few things. So, so like Simon, I've... Uh, and everybody around this room, I spent a lot of time going out and visiting. So in the last few months, I've been uh, everywhere from Carlisle in the north to Isle of Wight in the south. I've been in the A&E department in Whitehaven and the A&E department in Margate from coast to coast. And, and I think I reflect on what Matthew and, um, and Pauline have said. So firstly, I think during the winter months, uh, I think the feeling was certainly among staff that it was a better winter than last year and I think that's something that I absolutely heard uh, when we were in the depths of winters which doesn't, doesn't feel so very long ago. Um, that's the first thing. The second thing I'd say is that staff are working incredibly hard and those pressures remain and, and like everybody around the room I'm really grateful for all the hard work that all the clinical staff do but of course as a doctor particularly uh, doctors and the emergency uh, medicine staff and the, and the acute physicians that sit behind that and, and all the other specialists that put um, input in. Uh, and of course to our general practice colleagues because uh, we shouldn't forget that primary care is also doing an awful lot of work in this area. And then the third thing I'd say is I, I continue to see enthusiasm for new models and new ways of doing things. Uh, and so particularly in the same day emergency care, I'm always struck with where I go to. Uh, that places have got in place plans to do that and I saw that in action Margate uh, last week uh, and so I think there is a sense that there's a process of transformation going on and I think clinicians are really up for doing that. Right, thank you. David, do you want to come? So, so um, I think just to echo what Julian said is I think the management teams across the NHS did a wonderful job in landing the numbers where they did. However, in the category of unhelpful observations, lurking within the, uh, the pack is a, a slide on efficiency, which shows that we were nine, whilst we did a great job in delivering 3.1 billion of efficiency savings, that was 900 million less, sorry, 2 billion, 2.2, that's 900 million less than we had hoped for, and it was balanced by some over delivery on non recurrent savings, which just begs the question in an environment that we're going into this year where there is less scope um, for contingency as to how confident we might feel about the 1.1 to 1.5 percent efficiency plans and how rigorous and well founded they are because they're quite critical. Ian, do you want to comment on that? Uh, you and, and Julie? Yeah, I mean, I'd, I would say that you know there was significant efficiency delivered last year, but we have um, seen a trend over the last few years where, um, by international standards, stretching levels of efficiency are achieved, but they fall short of what the NHS needs, and that gap is typically made up by non-recurrent measures. Um, I think it is absolutely fair to say that that does need to change. Um, yeah. The um, plans that have been submitted um, for 1920, I think certainly on the provider side, um, which is where we're really talking about, um, uh, suggest that I think 
compared to any previous year, the overwhelming majority of trusts have signed up to their control totals. They have a budget that they their boards tell us that they can achieve with, which within, was which was our goal. So out of 226, all but four have signed up for their control totals. And that's really not been achieved before. But it is fair to say that that reform journey um, to support that is, is dependent upon making those recurrent savings. So I think my sense is that this will be something that the board will want to continue to pay attention to across the year. Yeah, I think for two reasons. One of the financial <coughs> plan, but the second thing is every pound of efficiency saving is invested in patient care. Yeah. I mean, it's fair to say that every pound is there for caring for patients. Exactly. exactly. And um, non-recurrent measures um, are clearly uh, not the answer because all that happens is that at the beginning of the next year you have to do those and the efficiency you then didn't do. Exactly. And so I think, you know, I don't at all decry the efforts of NHS staff, uh, but as I say, by any international standard, uh, the NHS is making significant efficiencies, but at the same time, um, that is a major priority for this year. Um, otherwise, uh, the financial settlement that we've got won't work. Yes, yes. Julian, do you want to give any different uh, well, thing opinion on is, the plans um, themselves? As we've completed the planning around, I mean, the pluses are the kind of alignment between commissioners and providers is much, much better than it was last year. So the sort of gaps you, you, we've historically seen between contracts and plans are sort of de minimis. Nonetheless, quite frankly, as we have spoken to the finance teams in the regions and the providers and CCGs, actually the, it's like the one thing we're now focusing on is, okay, where have you signed up to efficiency targets? And let's be really clear where you don't yet really have, you haven't really identified the actions. And so the focus of effort is already, and will certainly be over, over the next, well, the whole year, but at least the next couple of months, identifying those systems, those organisations where we, where there's not been sufficient progress in identifying how they're going to turn the number on the spreadsheet into the actual action. So that before I head off on my summer holidays, I've got a better confidence that that kind of number, which is fundamentally the biggest risk we face, as you've just said, is a much smaller uh, number than it even was at the point we concluded the planning round. And actually one of the reasons for concluding the planning round was to stop just talking about it and then get into can now see how that's turning into action. So um, how comfortable am I? I don't think I sit comfortably here today because I won't sit comfortably until you know there's real actions behind it. Richard? Uh, it's uh, a point of clarity for Julian again. So you, may, you mentioned the, the capital last year and the the overspend against the sort of the allocation and just to be just to be clear, unless my understanding is wrong, yet there isn't a capital allocation to NHS providers. So I don't want people to think this is a this is a failure of governance. The way the way the system currently works means right from the DH down to a provider there isn't a capital budget, which is one of the reasons why as part of long term plan changes and some legislative changes, we've got to make some pretty significant changes to the capital regime. So that Although in DH's books there will appear this £200 million issue, it's not a governance failure because there wasn't a budget against which to overspend. And it's probably just worth saying that's why I described it as an allocation in some ways. <laughs> Very careful. That's entirely correct. Language. Yeah. <laughs> entirely correct. <laughs> David. I'd just like to make a comment in relation to the point that David made about you know, deficiency gains is that um, we all know there are. There's a lot more fishes to go out of the NHS, but over time, if we're going to get real productivity improvements, you know, we're going to have to spend some capital. Yes. Um, and, you know, if people, if CT machines are breaking down because we can't replace them, or we're still operating under Victorian buildings because we can't move into new purpose-built, we're not going to get the productivity gains and the efficiency improvements. So I think, um, you know, we have to, this, the revenue account and the Capital are not wholly divorced from each yeah. other. You know, nope. we've, I think you know we've got a we've got a five-year agreement on revenue, but we've got to get a something a matching agreement on capital as well. But just to build on that, it's the it's the physical capital, the digital capital, and the human capital. Otherwise, we won't get the transformation that will deliver the <coughs> promise set out in the long-term plan. Yeah, I think we all agree. And actually, I'd add, add to that. I mean, Simon has made the point about the stock of health or ill health. You know, if we don't invest in prevention to reduce the stock of 
future ill health, then that is also building up. So that it is also capital in my book. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Any further comments or questions regarding operational financial performance? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. In which case, we move on, Matt, are you coming up to the table to talk us through where we are with the long-term plan implementation framework. Thank you very much, Dido. Um, so, as the board knows, in gen um, earlier this year we published the uh, long-term plan. In it, we um, set out that we would publish an implementation framework which would be used by ICSs and STPs over the summer to produce strategic plans covering uh, from this year to 23-24. That those plans would be brought together into a full implementation, national implementation plan um, by the end of the year um, um, and that we would publish. So today we are seeking the board's um, agreement and approval to publish the implementation uh, framework, um, which you have. Um, the process of creating that framework was based on a significant amount of engagement and I think there were three key things that came back from our engagement with systems, with uh, national stakeholders, with patient groups and with voluntary uh, VCSE um, organisations as well. The first was a genuine um, enthusiasm and desire to work with us to deliver across the entire breadth of the uh, long-term plan and make sure we deliver across that entire breadth. A second was um, a desire for some support on uh, sequencing um, of commitments within the long-term plan uh, to identify what are the things that we need to devote particular attention to uh, making good progress on in the early years. Um, and the third was to um, that as systems develop and continue to develop and grow, a desire that they will want to use this plan to build on existing strategies and partnerships they have in place and to reflect the particular local needs and starting points of their systems as they do that. Therefore, um, the first thing that this document has the, um, and seeks to do is to um, address those three points, to, to make a clear request to the NHS to um, plan to deliver um, across the entire breadth of the long-term plan, to, um, but also to acknowledge that the long-term plan set endpoints of 23, 24 for the majority of commitments. And for those commitments, we are asking systems to define their trajectory, um, working with their local partners to get to the agreed endpoint. Um, for a minority of areas, we um, are, are seeking um, additional uh, um, detail or setting additional um, um, trajectories, particularly where that involves creating the capacity that we need to deliver the totality of the long-term plan, for example, investments in primary community care, the expansion of those services, or around our meeting our mental health commitments. Um, the other area um, primarily where we're looking at uh, doing that is where it creates the structures that we require to deliver, particularly around um, establishing and growing and maturing our um, ICSs. The second thing this document does is um, it seeks to set out some principles that we're asking the NHS to, um, to use when developing their plans, that plans are clinically led, that they are locally owned, that they are built on a, um, a good understanding of um, workforce requirements and that those requirements are realistic, um, that um, they deliver the five financial tests set by government and deliver within the existing resources available to systems, and that they place prevention and inequalities right at the heart of their planning process. Uh, the third thing the document does is it seeks to support systems um, to do the, the strategic planning, um, um, and, and it does that by, first of all, giving additional certainty to systems uh, in addition to the five-year allocations they already have, indicative allocations they have, on the uh, service development funding that will be made available over the five years so they can plan within a specific financial um, envelope. Um, and we've also, as part of that, sought to make as much of that funding um, tied to the single process of agreeing their plans to uh, make it simpler and easier to them for them based on feedback that we have received from them. Um, the plan, the implementation framework sets out a small number of metrics or measures or starts to where we will be um, seeking to um, uh, measure and uh, test implementation um, and uh, test how implementation is going. And then finally, there are a lot of links in the document which link through to the, the, uh, the national and regional support offer that we are seeking to make available to systems so that systems will be supported at every step of the way to create these plans. Um, the final thing that I'll just say is that the, 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 the plan sets, uh, the framework sets out a timetable, and we are asking the systems to uh, agree their plans by the middle of November to allow us to bring that together into the full national implementation plan by the end of the year, as we have uh, committed to do. Thanks very much, Matt.
open up questions, comments. Andrew. Um, a lot of what we're trying to do here relies on ICSs and SDPs delivering a different type of service. Uh, and I'm <coughs> interested to know to what extent we're going to give you know maximum flexibility to local systems to deliver local priorities. So, for example, in the plan we've we've earmarked money for mental health, um, cancer, etc., which I assume will get evolved down to a system level. To what extent can systems flex that those allocations to meet their own kind of local needs? So if you're doing really, really well, for example, on mental health, can you do use that money for cancer where perhaps you're doing really, really poorly as a particular system? So um, within the plan, we've set out particular um, funding or investment guarantees around primary community care and mental health, which we will be um, um, measuring and ensuring that we deliver against. Um, beyond that, we are asking systems to deliver the outcomes that we've set out in the long-term plan within the funding and resources available to it. So there would, beyond that, there is um, some flexibility to systems. Yes. Okay. Thank you. No, I, mean, I, 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 I was just to say, I mean, just to take the mental health investments now, but we are absolutely committed each and every year to spend the amount of money we have committed to spend, and indeed are putting a good deal of effort into going and auditing and assuring ourselves that the money is actually being spent on the things uh, that it should be um, spent on. So I, I think there are one or two areas where absolutely we are not going to give the kind of flexibility you described, and I'd say mental health is like number one on there. Um, and indeed, even on the primary community care, again, we have specified the amount of money we are going to be spending by 23, 24, and we are looking to see people show steady progress, because we think you will actually need to spend that amount of money in order to deliver the workforce growth we think is required and some of the other investments. Okay. but. I, I get that, but it's, it's, it's where you've got systems. You take, say, primary um, care, I mean, there's a, there's a big chunk of money associated there. And in some systems, they're quite well developed. And I'm just, just testing whether or not there is some scope to, to buy money around from a particular set of. Well, I'll just come in behind what uh, Julian said. The answer is uh, across the board, generally, yes, but not on mental health no. and primary yeah. medical and community health services because those have been yeah. typically the two parts that have actually got squeezed rather than yeah. over invested mm -hmm. in. And frankly, there is no part of the country that is currently doing so brilliantly on its uh, mental health services that we can say, okay, take the take the foot off the gas and uh, just uh, at the margin use uh, what would have been mental health resources or something else. But that's you know that's still a minority of the total growth that will be available locally across the health service where people have got very significant discretion. Yeah. Bruce, did you want to come? Yes, thank you. So, thank you, Matt. And it's really great to see that workforce is part of the long term plan and implementation plan now because without the workforce, we won't be able to successfully see the implementation for patients and for the people that we serve. So, thank you. Um, I'm working really closely with um, Prana, the Chief People Officer, and indeed the colleagues in all of our ALBs, but particularly with HE, because we, nursing is a priority within it, and that's a priority not just for next year but right now. So I just wanted to um, assure the board that we're not just looking at this as a plan that is going to be um, sometime in November that we're going to be working on these. Actually right now we're starting to deliver the interim people plan and um, up to today we're now up to 7,000 clinical placements being pledged um, for this September by providers. So. We've busted that 5,000 clinical placement uh, target, so I'm delighted, I'm very grateful to the provider sector and to HEI sector for, for the work they're doing to, to really get behind uh, making sure that nursing is a reality uh, priority in the future, so thank you uh, for that. Steve? Uh, yes, thank you, Matt, and I'm particularly delighted that in uh, paragraph five of the board paper accompanying this, um, clinically led is at the top of the uh, list of uh, requirements that we are asking our local systems uh, to meet in developing their plans. I'm sure you haven't prioritised them in any particular way, but it's great that clinically led is at the start. And I think for Ruth and I, but really for everybody, uh, 
I'd like to stress the importance that clinicians get to the heart of the local plans, and uh, that means uh, working in their development, uh, both in terms of the content, but it, but in terms also of a mechanism, uh, particularly in, in, in our integrated care system development of integrated care systems, of bringing clinicians together from primary, secondary care, from mental health, and also colleagues in local government to uh, redesign clinical models uh, that will deliver the long-term plan. I know there are many areas of the country where those clinical, that clinical leadership, those clinical systems are in place and they should absolutely be utilised. I think this is also an opportunity for those areas where that development is further back to really use this to catalyse further development of a clinical leadership network uh, within the integrated care systems and SDPs. David, you want to come? Yeah, thanks, uh, Dado. Um, it's more of a comment than a question. I just wanted to emphasise this point um, that I think you drew out earlier about human capital and the importance of investing in that as well. I think the plan is welcome and I uh, enjoyed reading it. It's very clear. And the work which will be carried out locally over this next few months is hugely important so we can establish what the demand is in the future for, well, present and future for services. And that's resource, that's in the 20 billion in the investment which is being made. I think the trick then is to reconcile, and this is where the people plan work will come in, to reconcile that we've got the supply, particularly the education and training supply, for the workforce that can be bought with the 20 billion. And that's the bit that we need to just ensure we've got the investment in at the minute. I think we're making assumptions that that supply is there rather than we're absolutely clear. And I think this is why getting some clarity about what money is going to move where and why is hugely important because that then need, we need to uh, use that as a springboard to be clear about what is the workforce that's required. I think the other challenge that we've got to uh, respond to is this uh, emphasis in the people plan about more and different. Ruth has talked about the importance of being clear about how many more nurses we need but we also need to be clear about what skill mix we want to see going through. And I think that's a further work that needs to be done between the autumn. So the planning work which trusts are going to do between now and the autumn needs to come alongside the workforce planning, particularly the education planning. Yeah. The work for educational placements for next academic year uh, needs to be done like now. Uh, so just making sure we've got these alignments uh, is absolutely critical. And then making sure uh, that those uh, training places and particularly placements are in place to ensure that people on graduate programmes are coming into those placements. Mm -hmm. And I do want to emphasise uh, the importance of making sure that's a resourced plan mm -hmm. and not mm -hmm. just uh, this is what we'd like. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that work still needs to be done. Uh, and whether that's a conversation for the SR or that resource will come from other places, um, will get played out over the next period of time. But it's absolutely a critical element to the delivery. Um, so as I say, it's not a question, I just want to emphasise uh, the importance. I think what we've managed to do over the past uh, few months um, with the work that you've led on the Interim People Plan, Dido, is begin to realign service planning, workforce planning and financial planning. Mm. And uh, having done that, uh, we shouldn't let that slip away from Absolutely. us again. Uh, yeah. And that's a critical piece of work that needs to be done in the autumn. Yeah. And it's good to see that basic principle embedded in this implementation planning framework it, you know, more clearly than it probably has been in recent times. Uh, my point is, Ado, you've got that alignment, so we now just need to convert that into numbers and investment proposition. Actually. Yes, at both a local and a national level. Uh, quite so. Yes. David? Uh, maybe, this may be a question for you, Dido, or, or for David, actually. Is that, I mean, given that it takes 10 years, as we currently train doctors, it takes 10 years to be GP and up to 15 years to be a, a specialist in some specialties. We have no idea what doctors are going to be doing in 10 or 15 years' time, or very little idea. I mean, that what they do would have changed very fundamentally. So what conclusions do you draw from that for training and how we train doctors now? 
So this has been a big part of the interim people plan, and Steve will have a view on this, but you're seeing the interim people plan, um, that medical reform program that's uh, outlined in there is really addressing these issues about how we can create flexibility in the way that education careers are developed and, and worked, how we can create flexibility in uh, training and education structure to allow uh, people to move about. And this is my point about... Workforce planning is really difficult because you're predicting something 15 years out when science and technology is moving quickly. I think the fact this has never been landed, in my view, in the history of the NHS is not because people are incompetent, it's because it's really difficult to do. And um, I think what we need to do over this next period is create uh, some agility in the way that people are being trained and educated. That means an alignment with HEIs, the Royal Colleges, etc. And my sense, six months into doing the HEE job, is that this is a very fragmented sector. There's a lack of alignment between some of the key parties that need uh, to uh, act in this sector to um, advance this debate. But what I think has begun to happen over the past six months is a greater alignment. There was an advisory board for the People Plan where the universities, the VCs were represented at that. Uh, that's the first meeting I've gone to where vice chancellors were actually present talking about some of the issues around the future of health education alongside people from trust, uh, the national organisations, etc. So I think we are beginning to put uh, the conversations in place and begin to develop um, the mechanisms that will require. And this is why this work is important and I wanted to make this point because I absolutely support the long-term plan and direction of travel. But as you've just been talking, the trajectory is to 2023-24, 20, um, yet the supply line we need to get for <coughs> doctors goes well beyond 23-24. Um, and arguably, we needed to have some clarity with the universities for the young people that are going to start uh, university this autumn, um, because they won't be out and into the workforce until so that's 23, 2031, 2032. Uh, what are they being trained for? What is a world that they're being trained for? And um, I don't think we've had enough focus about that uh, conversation, to be honest. But that's the conversation we've been trying to carry into the VCs and the Council of Deans, etc., about how, how do we begin to come up with these issues, as well as, as Ruth said, the urgency of just making sure we've got enough nurses and nursing associates coming in to the system this year. So. Um, it's a hugely important debate, and the full people plan is important for setting not just the period to 23, 24, but beyond 24 uh, over the next decade or so. I think the question we need to answer is what will the workforce look like in 10, 15, and 20 years' time, uh, not just what it will look like in um, 2021, 21, 22. Steve? Yeah, so, so I think that question was at the heart of the discussions around the interim people plan, and it's in that chapter on 21st uh, century workforce. So as, as David said, um, so, so it's always been the case that the future is different from the present, and it's always the case that the next generation will be working differently. But I think it's going to be particularly true over the next 10 to 15 years uh, for two reasons at the very top of my list. One is the digital revolution, which will as we will start here in a few minutes, we'll uh, increasingly start to change the way that we work as professionals. I think the genetics revolution is another revolution that's going to occur over the next 10, 15 years that will make us think differently about risk and risk management and population management. So I think for all those reasons, it's really critical that, that and it's not just about doctors, it, that, that all clinicians think very hard about um, how we will be working in the next 10 to 15 years. Uh, and I think that's an international issue as much as it's a local issue, actually. And, and I think that involves uh, extending roles and working differently. I think it means working in teams much more than we uh, work at the moment. Uh, a whole variety of things. Uh, but we have to get it the right way around in terms of training. So I think it's for us as the service to describe to the trainers what, sort, what that workforce looks like. Uh, because then it's the task of the universities, the postgraduate curricula, of continuing professional development uh, to uh, allow our people, our staff, to, to develop those skills and those attributes. So that's a big piece of work going forward. Certainly talking to the medical royal colleges, who are very much part of my stakeholder group on the medical workforce, they are up for that challenge. And uh, I think there's a bit of an excitement, actually, about thinking quite bravely about um, what the future workforce might look like. Good. 
Sorry, can I just, okay. One of the things in, in, a, in a more commercial world is you wouldn't over-specialise mm -hmm. too early. And I wonder whether one of the things we also need to ask ourselves is whether it's not just the initial training, it's the point you were making, but also about the pathways by which doctors, nurses, clinicians generally develop their careers over time. So I'm struck by the extent to which specialism happens, in, and fine specialism, happens very early in people's careers. And at a time when technology is changing the way that, and, and there's a greater integration between different disciplines, I just wonder whether we should also ask ourselves that question, is, is how we develop and whether we over-specialise too soon. Yes, and that question has been asked, and, and the postgraduate curricula in medicine are certainly changing now and moving much more towards continuing to provide generalist training up until the point of, uh, uh, of certification as a consultant. But, but there's a conundrum in that question because medicine inevitably becomes more specialised. Yeah. So, so I often say that when the NHS was formed in 1948, I think it was somewhere around 50 years for medical knowledge to double and in 2020 it's estimated to be about 75 days for medical knowledge to double. So, so I think in the workforce of the future, one of the one of the tensions we need to solve is how we how we provide that specialist depth of knowledge uh, with the need to have a uh, a generalist uh, underpinning. And of course, primary care, which again we're going to hear about next, has in this country always been the bedrock of that generalism. Uh, so that's a it's, a it's a difficult conundrum to solve, but we absolutely have to ensure that we solve it. Right. And I think I'm right, Steve, to David's point that um, the work that has been going on about um, instead of having two years of generalism, having three years of generalism before people specialise in terms of their education, to pick up on exactly that point, to stop people specialising too soon in their careers and, uh, 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 and yeah. building that as part of the education system. Any other comments on the implementation planning framework? In which case, I think we should congratulate you, Matt, and the team who've worked on this. I know that actually there's been a huge effort to <coughs> consult and engage and shape this in a way that will genuinely help systems to build plans that will make a huge difference. So well done. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you. Good. Game of musical chairs. So we now move on to primary care. We should have Ed Waller, Dominic Hardy, and Nikki Kanani all going to sit on th two seats, I yeah. think. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, good team joint work. There you go. Fantastic. Ian, are you going to kick us off? Great. Thank you very much. Uh, this paper covers um, a lot of important content across seven different topics. Uh, first, the new funding guarantee for primary medical and community health services. It comes into effect next April. Uh, a minimum cash floor in every region against a baseline of 1819 planned spend. And as Julian has already said, um, a minimum cash floor in every ICS by 2324. This guarantee is of immense interest to community providers and primary care, as well as CCGs and STPs. Um, it's uh, prominent in the long term plan implementation framework, and I encourage all to clock now what it means. Second section, uh, the NHS uh, now has its inaugural Director of Community Health Services. By autumn, Matthew Wynn will have staffed up his new group, working alongside the team here with clear priorities. The key to our two-day targets for crisis care and reablement, anticipatory care for complex patients and care home support, both jointly with primary care, set out in national service specifications for community services for the first time, phased in line with the funding guarantee um, uh, of investment. But these goals uh, need considerable workforce expansion and workforce productivity gains. So we'll be working with Prana, with help from Hugh implementing, Pat, your report on efficiency in community services, and with help from Matthew Gould on upping our work on digital in community services. Third section, the new five-year GP contract marks the biggest changes since 2004. It's landed pretty well. Major changes have already been implemented and are being felt. Uh, 
such as indemnity and the Reform GP Quality and Outcomes Framework. Uh, and I'd like to highlight three additional specifics today. So first, uh, we can uh, confirm uh, at the pipeline of seven further quality improvement modules for the QOF. And mindful of Matthew's and Joanne's earlier comments about the importance of learning disability, I'm particularly delighted to announce agreement with the BMA to seek early delivery of our learning disability commitments in primary care. So focus on improved practice registers, more flu jabs given high respiratory mortality as shown in the leader reports, uh, and the ambition for early delivery of the 75% coverage goal in the long-term plan for comprehensive learning disability health checks aided by a new QOF quality improvement module for learning disability coming in in 2021 and a national campaign. And the third thing I wanted to pick up in this section relates to the conversation we've just been having around workforce. So, um, David, you talked about the importance of um, skill mix. We have a plan for 20,000 additional staff in very specific roles where we know we have both demand and supply, but we also know we need to do more on GP and indeed nurse numbers. And today's paper sets out some of the additional approaches we are exploring for the final people plan, how to make it more attractive for sessional GPs to increase their time commitments to primary care networks, a clearer national glide path uh, from postgraduate training through into working in general practice and a re-examination uh, with uh, HE colleagues of our national modelling assumptions within the context of the spending review. Again, working very closely with Prana. The fourth section covers the formation of primary care networks before next Monday's go live date. And this highly complex exercise has stimulated what's ended up um, looking like uh, 1,259 uh, legally binding alliances between practices without gaps across England in line with our rules, with only 26 of nearly 7,000 practices opting out, only a handful expecting to join and wanting to, but not likely to be in a network by the 1st of July, um, and only 26 um, networks that are smaller than 27,000 populations due to rurality. So this, we think, is 99.7% um, uh, coverage of practices. The numbers have improved uh, in just the last few minutes uh, since Matthew uh, revealed 98%. Uh, these numbers are unconfirmed reports from CCGs, and the position is changing daily. So the final numbers for 1st of July will probably be slightly different. And there are some notable teething problems. This is inevitable, and Ed's been grappling um, with a number of the hardest of those. What's really striking is we're seeing a new generation of uh, enthusiastic primary care leaders coming to the fore as clinical directors. I was really struck by this. We had a great joint event with the BMA recently. And um, the BMA team and our team, uh, we didn't know at least half the people in the audience. Um, and the event was massively oversubscribed. Uh, I mean, I thought that this process might go better than I was expecting, but not by this much. Uh, general practice <laughs> has <laughs> stepped up. <laughs> that's, that's such a meta point. <laughs> <laughs> I was just checking who was listening. Though, so, uh, the prize goes to our chief executive. Um, general practice has stepped up. And I'd also like to thank the huge amount of work undertaken by CCGs working really well with the local medical committees, the local branches of the BMA and our regions. Uh, the fifth section, the formation of primary care networks is of course just the start. We have a significant development and support plan and just creating a network does not overnight solve the considerable workload and workforce challenges in general practice. We need to continually remember this. But what will success look like uh, if we look forward a number of years. First of all, uh, they will have stabilised general practice and we've given the existing partnership model a major shot in the arm through the new contract. It will now be down to PCNs 
to ensure that there's a new generation of partners if the independent contractor model is to endure in 2030. Primary care networks will have helped tackle some of the capacity gaps. They would have employed over 20,000 extra pharmacists, physios, paramedics, physician associates and social prescribers who become an integral part of the practice team. Networks will be moving from the current more introverted process of practices joining together to looking out. And above all, this is the critical point, having done those things, PCNs will have been able to have shown quantified impacts for their patients and the wider NHS, thus justifying the funding guarantee. That is the purpose of setting these up, and that's what we're looking for over the next five years. The sixth section of the paper um, covers digital primary care, and the boards uh, asked to approve the launch of a new consultation. Uh, this honours the commitment to review the out-of-area registration rules and associated payment arrangements, and we're seeking views by the 22nd of August. Under the terms of the new contract, all patients will have a right to digital first primary care by 2021 from their existing practices, and our most important task is to help existing practices digitise supported by a new supply framework. We've also seen the emergence of digital first practices directly registering patients in competition with existing GPs using the current out of area rules. And this means, uh, for example, that the GP at hand practice in Hammersmith has a wide distribution of patients all across London, which cuts across the need to integrate care in local networks, as well as causing funding issues for Hammersmith CCG. And we're proposing to fix this issue by creating in regulations a new mechanism to disaggregate the practice list automatically when a threshold number of out-of-hour patients is reached in any CCG, and we're suggesting that's between 1,000 and 2,000, and this would trigger the automatic creation of a new practice list for GP at hand in, say, Tower Hamlets, where they would need to provide premises, be part of a local Tower Hamlets network, and meet all service requirements. We also propose a new quarterly adjustment to CCG allocations, working closely with Julian and his team, to reflect better the movement of patients, thus solving the Hammersmith CCG funding problem, uh, the consultation also analyzes and makes recommendations on changing specific payment rules. And finally, it starts an important conversation about whether new national rules on establishing new practices in our most underdoctored areas could help tackle the inverse care law and inequalities. Mm. Seventh and finally, we publish our interim review of GP premises. We'll be taking forward a number of recommendations the biggest issue, and this relates, uh, I think, Dido, to your comment about um, the capital challenges we face, is the scale of premises that are not fit for purpose. And making progress on that clearly depends on the capital settlement in the spending review. To help with what is known as the last man standing problem, we are committing the NHS to standing behind some leases exactly which ones uh, to be worked through and discussed, including with the BMA, standing behind some leases of strategic importance. We'll be piloting new types of premises reimbursement at network level, and we'll be encouraging primary care networks to think about premises needs at network level rather than just individual practice level and jointly with their community partners. I commend the paper to the boards, and specifically seek endorsement to launch the consultation on digital first. Fantastic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who's? No? Um, yeah, can I just offer um, a comment in support, particularly of Ian's initiative around Chapter 4 in the consultation around digital first in primary care? Um, to support our inequalities program. I think it's bold, it's brave, it's absolutely the right thing to do. Um, but I would also suggest in the consultation process that the evaluation mechanism to understand whether it's making an impact or not 
really picks up on the learnings that we've had over the last year in introducing the NHS app into a variety of areas where, as you know, we test and test and test again against the whole diversity of the populations. And some things work and the engagement results are very good, some things don't work quite so well. And I think it's really key to broaden out what we mean by digital first in uh, supporting the inequalities program. Sometimes we've found text, actually, bizarrely, uh, is far more effective than more sophisticated tools. So there's a breadth of what we mean by digital first to support inequalities that I'd encourage the evaluation process to test a range of possible digital tools and not just go for the, let's say, the most obvious, which is through an app, because we, we are still learning a huge amount here and there is a lot that we do not know about what really is effective in primary care digital first and, and what is less effective. So, a great point, uh, Noel. Um, we'll take that away um, and uh, uh, take it into account exactly as you suggest. Really helpful. Other comments? Pat? Well, I'd just say what, uh, how, much, how welcome this is, and I really, particularly the um, solutions to solving some of the challenges you face in GP land. And um, to really take the lead in this uh, internationally, it seems to me, I looked at Tim Ferriss there, but uh, I think if we can get this out there and working, it will be a significant, sort of really significant for our population, particularly in those deprived areas, will also actually show other countries what we can do. I think it's really important for our standing that we do this quickly, wholeheartedly. And undoubtedly that, that it, it will raise issues with colleagues, etc., but we have to be resolute, I think, in pushing on and demonstrating we can actually deliver it, but I'm really delighted to see this piece of work. Um, thank you, Ian. I think there's a, there's a lot in here and it's very exciting, challenging also. Um, I wondered if you might tell us a little bit more about how you think the Digital First initiatives might um, uh, uh, help with some of the G GP shortages we have and um, opportunities it might offer to GPs. Maybe that's a linky question, actually. So the, the interaction between digital and the workforce. That was a nod. Great question. Thank you, Joanne. Um, one of the things that we know is that we've got the severest GP shortages in areas of socioeconomic deprivation. The other thing that we know is that our workforce is changing and wants to work differently. So I went to Frimley recently and I met a salary GP who spends one day a week clinically in practice, two days being mum. The the fourth day, she is a GP, but she does it from home. So she does the drop-off, does telephone triage, does all her admin, picks up, puts the kids to bed, and then finishes doing her telephone triage, because that works for the population as well. They want to get their calls after work. What we need to be able to do is create a system where our workforce can work more flexibly and joined up and be at home and be able to access the record and do the referrals and everything else, but also create the capacity in places where people don't want to work at the moment for lots of reasons, but it does tend to be areas that um, face more socioeconomic deprivation. So if we can create a space where we can build the capacity, even if it's virtual, then it gives a chance to those populations. On Noel's point about the app and texting, we have um, right back texting in our, in our GP system and you know you will get certain members of the population who will only ever text back through that to tell us what's going on because it's just too overwhelming to get to the practice so I think we've got two really clear ways through this consultation to work on a better offer for the population but also to offer a more flexible approach for our for our, for our workforce and do you think Nikki that that might bring more um, doctor capacity back into work yeah I mean one of the things that um, in fact one of the, the challenges that Simon sent me very early on was actually if we could get everyone working just one more session each then we'd probably go a long way towards tackling our uh, recruitment and retention issues and um, this is about bringing back some of the joy and value at work that general practice feels that it's lost and actually if you can work in a more flexible way and if you can spread the workload with the people that we're bringing in through the contract then actually people will come back and work more and the other thing that will bring back to to local places our sessional workforce so at the moment our sessional workforce is fairly scattered and I just spent a huge amount of time with them and said you know what is it that you miss they want education and training but actually they want to work within a smaller geography and if they can technologically be supported to do that we'll get the participation up and we'll make sure that we build continuity back into the system great that sounds really good thank you Tim you want to start well just to um, 
I'll pick up on Patrick's comment and, and reinforce it and reinforce all the positive uh, comments uh, around here. This is, um, uh, I, I would say, um, reviewing your paper and the, the thoughtfulness and the, uh, the beta testing that you've done and the, um, the early launches. Um, I'm, uh, I, I think there is no doubt in my mind that this program, for, for all the challenges that you face, for the unintended th uh, things that will occur in the future, it is nonetheless, um, uh, it shows uh, extraordinary promise. And, and I would say very directly international leadership. This will uh, leap ahead of um, what uh, many other countries, including my own, have been working so hard to achieve and, and yet have only had spotty um, uh, uptake. Um, so I'm, I'm very uh, encouraged and, um, uh, and I, I, I look forward to hearing the, um, the next uh, six, nine, 12 month uh, reports because I think they're gonna be very positive. David, you wanted to come in? Yes, it's, it's a question I think for Nicky really, but when Ian was doing his, his introduction, he said that this was going to be a real sort of boost for, or for sort of the partnership model of GP care. Now, clearly it's, it could go one or two ways or in both ways in terms of him. But what would, if you were making a, a well-informed guess of what primary care might look like in 10 years, or, or what GP, GPs might look like in 10 years' time. Do you think the partnership model is going to be as strong in 10 years' time as it is now? Yeah, I, I think you'll, I mean, I'm sure you've tested this question on me on a visit, David. <laughs> um, so I, th I think it'll be stronger, actually. If we get this right, um, and I, I believe we will, I think it'll be stronger. What's happened to the partnership model is that um, because of the pressure for, for the workload, for, for the workforce, and we've rehearsed the reasons, um, people have stopped finding it attractive and necessarily... Um, encouraging others to come into it, and and, and, and it's sort of disassociated with, with, from the true values of kind of traditional uh, general practice. So I think we can uphold those values, um, and and strengthen it, and encourage people to come back into partnership. What I do think is we will still have a workforce that floats at a network level because I don't think we can get away from the fact that our workforce does want to work differently in a more portfolio way, in a more flexible way that we've picked up through the, through the work in the people plan. Um, so we won't get away from that entirely. But I think the partnership model will feel slightly different. It will be okay to be a six session partner and to do a day a week at home with your digital consultations. Um, we will change the way that we describe partnership. So it isn't just about owning premises, but it is about rebuilding that relationship with your patient and that family. And I think we'll bring more people back into partnership um, and we'll have a mixed, a, a blended workforce model that reflects the population as well. It won't be the same in every part of the country, and that's the beauty of the network model. Could I add, David, I think at the moment, in the last few years, there's been a sense of decline and a fear of uh, potentially terminal decline of the uh, partnership model. That's been the concern of GPs. It's been harder and harder to get new GP partners. And what this is doing, and before that, the work on the GP Forward View is stabilize the situation and make sure that actually it's a choice for the profession. So in some places, some GPs will want to work more closely, possibly directly with and for their acute or community partners. And that's fine if that's the choice they want to make. Uh, we're getting to the position where it actually by stabilizing it, it will be up to the profession itself to decide which of those two paths they want. Any further comments? Congratulations on a very good piece of work. Well done. Well, uh, thanks to the teams and uh, the many others that have yeah, done the work. Absolutely. Well done. So, moving on, we'll let you. So we're now moving on to items which shouldn't routinely be prescribed in primary care. Steve, are you talking to this? We should have Graham. Hello, Graham. Hello. Graham Jackson joined us. Yes, thank you, Dido, and it's a pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Graham Jackson, uh, who uh, is uh, the co-chair of the clinical working group that underpins this work, uh, to join us uh, at the board table and to provide the richness of answers to the questions that I, where I require richness. And Alex Williams from our policy teams 
uh, will provide even more richness where Graham needs that as well. So uh, there's, a, there's a team here to respond to it. <laughs> um, yes. um, so, so as the board will remember, about 18 months ago in November 2017, uh, we published uh, guidance to CCGs. Uh, from NHS England jointly with NHS clinical commissioners on uh, a list of items uh, should not routinely prescribed in primary care and that included recommendations on 18 items and we uh, committed to reviewing the guidance at least annually uh, and that has been done and the clinical working group undertook a review uh, during the summer of 2018 and of those recommendations uh, that were made previously uh, that work proposed that uh, there should be an update to one of them, which is the use of capsaicin cream, and that is in the updated guidance. But the clinical working group also proposed an additional eight items be included in the uh, CCG guidance for cons uh, uh, would, that would then be um, consulted upon. So those were five of uh, relatively low clinical effectiveness, all which are unsafe, and that includes am amiodarone and dronodarone, which are drugs used to uh, treat uh, uh, abnormal rhythms of the heart. Uh, bath and shower preparations used in dry and pr uh, pruritic skin conditions, minocycline, which is a treatment for acne, and silk garments, which are predominantly used in the treatment of uh, um, eczema. And then three items uh, where we know that uh, these items are clinically effective, but where there are more cost-effective uh, items available. So that's alaskirin, which is a treatment for blood pressure, and in diabetes, blood glucose testing strips for type 2 diabetes, and needles for pre-filled and reusable insulin pens. Uh, so a three-month formal public consultation on the new draft CCG guidance uh, was undertaken between the 28th of November last year and the 28th of February this year, and the results of that consultation are presented in the board, in the, uh, board papers uh, that you have in front of you today, along with the updated guidance as a result. Uh, the guidance uh, highlights some changes that were made to the draft proposals as a result of the consultation. Uh, so the definition of routinely was slightly amended to reflect that the recommendations apply to the routine prescribing of items in primary care and not to patients where there is a clinically exceptional reason for a prescription. Uh, there was uh, some updated linked uh, shared care guidance for amiodarone and dronodarone. Uh, and in particular uh, for uh, needles for pre-filled and reusable insulin pens clarification on safety. And there was one item that we have removed uh, for the moment uh, from uh, the guidance, uh, and that is uh, on uh, blood glucose testing strips, uh, because as a result of information that was presented to us in the consultation and further information from our diabetes team in NHS England and NHS Improvement, we want to do a bit more work on understanding differences in the potential differences in quality of strips and also the relationship between the strips and the machines that are used uh, to put the strips in to, to get the results. And we believe that we need uh, more detailed work on that, which we will um, undertake uh, before making a recommendation. Uh, and then finally, uh, on, on bath and shower preparations and on uh, for dry and peripheral skin conditions and silk, silk garments. Uh, we also undertook some additional evidence reviews uh, by our specialist pharmacy uh, service and those evidence reviews are also provided for you uh, in the pack. Um, so that has resulted in the, in the guidance that you have before us today uh, and so I'd formally like the board to consider and note the findings of the public consultation in relation to that one updated item and the eight new items and to approve the final recommendations and the publication and dissemination of updated guidance to CCGs. I should just say this is an item for the NHS England board, but one that we were comfortable bringing to the joint boards in common. Any comments? Questions? Munir? Uh, I am a clinician and uh, I just want to uh, welcome uh, the, the suggestions. Just wanted to clarify whether some of the drugs such as amiodarone, dronadrone, um, are those to stop at initiation or for repeat prescription as well? Uh, does it cover both? Is it just going to be specialist prescription for, for, for some of those drugs? Uh, it's a good question. The, the, those drugs have, as you're aware, been declining their usage over yeah. the last few years due to really the safety concerns and other alternatives. So I think we're advising to not to start new patients on them, but actually be structured deprescribing where appropriate. So, so it's very important in these guidelines. We don't set the, the hairs running and, we, and people are taking off drugs and destabilised. There are people who are stable on those drugs for many, many years and are clinically 
appropriately treated. So indicate individual cases need to be reviewed. If there's a case for review and maybe consideration with consultant colleagues from primary care to look at alternatives, then that we would advise that. But certainly it's more an issue of not initiating those, but doing a clinical review and a structured deprescribing as clinically appropriate. John? Um, Steve Graham, thank you very much. I, I mean, I think this stuff is very difficult to do, and I think that it's only achievable because you go about it in such a sort of rigorous and consultative way. There's a massive amount of work in this. Um, I wondered if you might like to say a little bit more about how um, we go from here, the guidance, to um, implementation and to make sure that, these, that this guidance is followed in the future. How, how does that work? Uh, well, well, I can certainly start. So it's very, it was very important throughout the board meetings that we made, remind ourselves we were creating commissioning guidance. So guidance for CCGs to implement. Mm -hmm. Based on clearly as NHSC co co chair, I'm going to say CCGs are the ones who have to, the legal responsibility to, to do that. And, and we did pull ourselves back sometimes and saying we're not creating clinical guidance. That's created by very uh, er other areas. So the best we can do is the best evidence to create the commissioning guidance to the CCGs. But then there is an issue about monitoring and, uh, and ongoing uh, feedback from CCGs. Now we do that through NHS clinical commissioners supporting our members. But there's also other ways looking at prescribing reviews, looking at prescribing data. So I think that we, we have seen, I mean, you've seen some data here, we have seen a fall off already in, in, in prescribing. We do a lot of data sharing between CCGs, peer review. We've got some great graphs that show var variation beyond demographic variation. So we know that this, this stuff can, can work uh, appropriately for the outcomes of our patients. So it is commissioning guidance. We need to make sure the CCGs are bought into that. Yes, yeah, so, so of course this is this is clinically based guidance and the principles of all these programs is that it's based on clinical guidance and a clinical evidence base but of course uh, we can track in a number of ways including financially because we can uh, we can um, translate a, a, an anticipated change in activity into a change in, in cost and and I can say that uh, that in 1920 our, our tracking is broadly on track at the moment as uh, against our expectations. Any other comments? Excellent. In which case is the NHS England board happy to approve? Fantastic. Thank you very much, Graham. So, uh, Jessica, mm. next item, um, a standing item, just a, a report from our board committees in common? Yes. Um, there's nothing particular to draw to your attention on this unless the chairs of the committees want to make um, any points on these. Richard and Joanna, is there anything you want me to raise? Um, we don't think there is anything. Good. Um, maybe just, um, given we're at annual report time and accounts, yes. I don't know whether uh, Julian perhaps wants to just sort of quick update for the whole board, given that this will be signed up through so um, I think it's true now for both NHSI and NHSE that the um, accounts are now finalised. Certainly we have been waiting for one or two issues on the provider side to uh, get sorted, they're now done. Um, and the annual reports are then drafted and um, I think we're pretty close to being ready to sign off, he says. Yeah. Well, we're meeting tomorrow, so that yeah, would be good. Too. When do you think they'll be laid before Parliament? So that is... A, uh, can I come back and at least <laughs> tell the board outside? Because I honestly, I, I, I don't have the date in my head. We are trying to get them done before... Um, I mean, they actually need to be laid before summer recess. So yeah. they pretty much be, need to be laid within the next two weeks, and I think we're ready to do it indeed within the next yes. uh, week or so. Yeah. Good. So my apologies for not being... No, that was the key point. I mean, from our point of view, we would like these transparently to be published as soon as possible, mm -hmm. i.e. get them laid before the summer break. Sometimes there has been delays based on other government business, but that's obviously outside of our control as two organisations. I think there is sometimes a desire to have all the health ones on the same day to yeah. the department itself, which has been, right. I think, the issue in the past of that time. Well, we're beautifully synced up yes. as E&I yes. anyway, so yes. that's not going to be the rate yes. limiting factor this year. Yes, yeah. indeed. Good. Um, Andrew, is there anything from the People Committee? 
Um, Ara's not here, and we've had a long DQPC this morning. Uh, I th this, we should mark, I think this is only our second cycle of all our subcommittees. And you know, there's, it, it's, you know, I'd like to say thank you to Jessica and the Board Secretariat team. It has been no mean feat trying to coordinate us all and create that structure. And there's clearly lots more for us to keep learning and improving, but so it's a major step forward, so thank you. Uh, and you get to have the final item, a governance yes. update. Would you yes. So quickly this, talk to this? This um, paper provides the board with a, an update on progress made on developing a shared governance model for both um, organisations. We, um, as Dido mentioned, have um, committees in common in place now. We are currently working through the schemes of delegation for both NHS England and NHS Improvement to um, make some further amendments as the operating model changes but for today what we would like to um, uh, present to the board is the final terms of reference for the provider oversight committee and the regional support groups uh, which are both um, executive committees but in the case of the provider oversight committee reporting into the NHS improvement board um, uh, uh, that deal with um, uh, both the provider and in the regional support group <coughs> the commissioning side of our executive business. Ian, do you want to just say anything about the Provider Oversight Board as the, the chair? Provider Oversight Committee, sorry. Yes, I mean, it's, I think it's, um, it is undoubtedly the case that, notwithstanding the fact that um, uh, our job is to uh, support improvement rather than to see regulation as our predominant tool, um, nonetheless, there are some statutory duties um, and decisions that are reserved to NHS improvement in relation to uh, provider regulation, the oversight of transactions and investments, um, and uh, the Provider Oversight Committee provides a an appropriate governance shell for those decisions, including uh, when organisations are formally entered into and exit from special measures, when provider regulatory action is necessary uh, to be taken. So I think it's an important clarification that as we come together very, very appropriately as NHS and NHS improvement working together, nonetheless there needs to be a, uh, an appropriate uh, uh, secure governance um, uh, forum in which uh, provider regulatory decisions can be taken and that is exactly what this committee is uh, now established and already working to undertake. So I think it's uh, a necessary and important piece of our collective governance um, and, and one that I'm glad is in place. Any questions or comments? You're all happy to note it. Excellent. Yeah. Um, in which case, I think um, we can draw to a close the public meeting, and we should finish by another thank you to Wendy, to Matthew, and to Ian, except to say that, that actually your work isn't yet done, as we have to reconvene in private session um, in a few minutes. <laughs> but I think we should at least end the public meeting by recording our thanks again. Thanks very much, everyone.